So, as you might be able to guess from uh, some of the things I do on my free time, climbing, canyoneering, uh, I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. Mm -hmm. Spend a lot of my free time scaring my mom. <laughs> um, and fear is something I'm personally very interested in. So today we're going to be talking about all the creepy crawlies, the things that are out here in this desert that scare us, um, and about fear itself. Uh, uh, in Massachusetts, I'm from a town called Peabody, uh, which is right next to Salem, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. home of the, the famous witch trials. Mm -hmm. So um, fall, Halloween, one of my favorite times mm -hmm. of the year. So I'm hoping this will start to get those of us who celebrate into the spirit um, uh, Halloween and the, and the fall season, even though it doesn't feel like it outside right now. <laughs> right. Um, so, what situations make you feel scared? Can anyone think of a situation that they were in when they felt scared? Snake on the trail. Snake on the trail. Yeah, that's a really great one. What kind of snake was it? Do you know? Um, oh, I've seen them all. Bull snakes, rattlesnakes, garter snakes. Okay. They're, they're all creepy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> We're definitely going to be talking about those later, so sorry. You might see some pictures of them. <laughs> Lightning storm. Lightning storm. Yeah, that's a really great one. We had some pretty crazy flooding here in Moab not that long ago. Um, and for me, that was pretty scary. I spend a lot of my time. Uh, I'm a Canyonlands Ranger, so I spend a lot of time down in the canyons uh, for work and on my days off. And so storms like that that can bring heavy rain really scare me too because uh, of that risk of flash flooding. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I know another situation that tends to make me feel scared is talking in front of an audience like this. <laughs> I've got a lot of practice, um, but it doesn't seem to matter how often I do it. Uh, when I'm up here, I'm definitely feeling a little sweaty. My mouth gets dry. Um, my heart starts racing a little bit. When you all are in those situations where you feel scared, what are some of the other things that you feel when you're scared? Heightened imagination. Yeah, yeah, your brain starts going a million miles an hour. Sure. Those are all things that can happen when you get scared. And I think for a lot of us, this landscape can evoke a lot of these feelings. Whether you're out on the trail, you run into a snake or the creepy creature, or just the landscape itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I know a bunch of you said you were visiting. Is anyone visiting from like a city? A city? A city, yeah. Yeah, okay, Denver. Yeah, somewhere used to having cell service, lots of older <laughs> people around. Uh, Moab is kind of the opposite of that, especially if you're going out into arches or canyonlands. You might not have cell service like you're used to. You might be going way out on the trail. Uh, are there isn't anyone to help you if you were to run into one of those snakes? Your mind might start going a million miles an hour, making up some of these like, what if scenarios. What if I run into a snake? What if I run into a spider? What if I run into you know, some other creature I don't even know is out here? Um, I think this landscape really does the, the blankness of it. Uh, allows us to project a lot of fear. So when I'm at the visitor center, I get asked a lot about some of the critters that people might run into on the trail, whether it's snakes, spiders, scorpions, or even like mountain lions or bears. Uh, so those are all some of the things we're going to be talking about today, as well as fear itself. Uh, so I mentioned, you know, some of the things that you feel when you're scared uh, that racing heartbeat, sweaty palms, um, and those are all of a result of the things that happen in your brain when you get scared. So when you get scared, uh, there's a little part of your brain, the amygdala right here, um, that kicks into action. That is what fires up your fight or flight response. 
Uh, has anyone heard of that before? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Now, so when you are in a situation uh, where your brain says, well, I don't know, this might not be a good situation for us to be in, uh, your amygdala you know, starts to uh, flood your brain with cortisol, which is a stress hormone, makes you feel a little stressed, and then adrenaline, uh, which is that kind of rush that a lot of us are familiar with and will help you assess the situation so get your, your brain running um, and also release glucose into your blood system to give you like a little burst of energy uh, so that if you were in a situation where you encountered something scary and you needed to fight it off, you have the energy for that. Um, your muscles also start to get um, flooded with blood to give you that strength to fight if you needed to, to run away really fast if you had to. Um, your digestive system actually starts to slow down a little bit and blood, uh, the circulation changes. So that's what gives you that kind of butterflies in your stomach feeling that I know I have right now. Um, and then also your, your muscles tense. Every single muscle in your body, even some of the ones you don't think about, like the ones in your skin around your hair follicles. So if you're really, really scared, you might get goosebumps. That's from the tightening of those muscles kind of by your hairs. For us, that just kind of makes us look a little funny, our skin look a little funny. Um, but if you're a much fluffier animal, like a cat or a dog, it can make you look much bigger and much scarier um, to whatever is scaring you. And so here, it has a purpose. We don't feel scared just because it's actually our body um, helping us survive. We've all gotten here today because, you know, our ancestors all the way back, you know, infinitely into time, they were able to escape dangerous situations and survive uh, to create you. And they likely wouldn't have been able to, done, to do that if they didn't feel scared in situations where they were faced with a predator, or if they didn't feel scared when they were too high up in a tree and could fall. Mm -hmm. um, and so fear, this response has developed to help us, uh, to help us get through all of the situations that we might face in our lives, whether we are out in the wilds, somewhere like arches or canyon lands, or um, maybe just going about our everyday lives. Um, so there are some things that we seem to be innately afraid of. Um, some things we really can't help being afraid of, uh, like snakes. And there are some things that we've learned to be afraid of. There you have it, fear for spiders and snakes might not necessarily uh, be your fault, might be hardwired into you. Um, I know, you know, my dad, he's a dairy farmer. He's a big dude. His hands are like baseball gloves, <laughs> usually just shaking his hand will leave other people a little bit afraid. Um, there's only two things he's afraid of. One of them is snakes. <laughs> um, my mom, however, on the other hand, loves snakes. Uh, so she somehow has overcome this innate fear of those snakes, while well, my dad uh, seems to have held on to it. They don't bother me too much, uh, so I guess I get that from my mom. Um, and I think also too, it's worth noting that there are probably other innate fears that we have, other than snakes and spiders. Uh, if you saw in that video, they also mentioned that other common fears are fears of heights, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Fears somewhere high and you fall, that could have some serious consequences for you. Um, another one being predators. Um, in that video, they say that, you know, you don't get the same response for seeing a bear or something like that, but I can imagine when you're out there, you see a big animal moving toward you, you get that innate fear response. Um, we also have a lot of learned fears that we encounter 
every day in our lives. Uh, sometimes we can unlearn these fears and learn nuance. Uh, so a lot of the fears that are really common uh, are like social fears, fear of failure, um, a fear of public speaking, or maybe a fear of letting down your loved ones, um, disappointing someone. All those things are learned fears. Uh, so, you know, getting yelled at, doing something you're not supposed to, uh, those things that help us learn how to act responsibly in a social structure, those are all kind of learned fears. Um, we can also have learned fears of other animals. The other thing my dad's afraid of uh, is mice. He does not like the mice, <laughs> um, which is funny because he is so large and they are so small. Um, but things like mice might not necessarily be innately afraid of, like snakes, but you know he has seen that mice carry diseases. Um, you know he's got a lot of critters of his own to take care of, all the cows and. Mice can cause a lot of problems um, with diseases, also getting into some of the feed that we feed the cows, and they can spoil it, and they um, kind of ruin the packaging when we put it in. And so I think that's where like a little bit of that fear of them comes from. It's not necessarily you know the animal itself, but it's what it can cause and what he's learned that um, those little critters can do. Uh, the consequences of having them around. So mm -hmm. um, we're first going to focus on these innate fears. So sorry for anyone who uh, <laughs> loves snakes. Um, but we do have some of them out here. Um, we've got quite a few species. The one that most folks are most concerned about when they talk to me at the visitor center desk are rattlesnakes, uh, like this midget faded rattlesnake right here. Uh, they're one of the more common rattlesnakes you'll find around here. They're also one of the more venomous. Um, they're pretty small. They only grow to be about 20 to 24 inches, uh, hence the, the midget and the midget faded. Compared to other rattlesnakes, their colors tend to be much lighter, helps them blend into uh, these sandy, dusty environments. I was actually with a friend when this photo was taken. And I was standing right here. <laughs> um, I didn't even see the snake until I was right on top of it. So its camouflage uh, was working, those dusty colors. Um, but snakes, they, even though they can be, they can be scary, uh, they can be venomous. So if they bite you, that's uh, gonna hurt a lot. Can be potentially very bad for you. Um, they do a lot for us. Um, they help keep rodent populations in check. Rodents carry a lot of diseases that can affect us as well. Um, they provide food sources for larger predators and raptors. So if anyone's a fan of bird watching, um, these guys are food for a lot of like the very cool um, raptors that we have around here. Golden eagles, bald eagles, hawks, um, peregrine falcons and um, they actually can also help disperse seeds. So when they eat those rodents, uh, after they digest them, it passes through their digestive system, um, their waste can contain seeds that the mice have eaten, because that's not really where they get their nutrients from. That's not uh, what their bodies are designed to break down and absorb nutrients from. So. Um, they tend to travel a lot further than some of the rodents out here. Like pack rats only travel about 200 feet from their nests, not very far. Uh, snakes will travel much, much farther. Uh, so they can help plants spread those seeds, which is really important in areas where maybe have been disturbed by cattle grazing um, or other human activity. They can help kind of bring that area back to a really healthy environment. Uh, so even though these guys are scary, you get a little too close, uh, <laughs> they also do a lot for us. They're really important to the ecosystems that we have around here. Um, fortunately, rattlesnakes are also quite polite. They always let you know that you're around and then you're getting um, in their personal <coughs> space. 
Uh, they have those rattles on the ends of their tail that will let you know that you're a little too close. That's just their way of saying, hey, I, I'm going to need you to back up. Uh, and rattlesnakes also, given the chance, will always back away. They don't want to bite you. They don't want to fight. That costs a lot of the precious energy that they have stored up. This desert is a really difficult environment for critters to live in. Uh, so he's just trying his best, you know? Um, I have another snake around here that is pretty cool are these gopher snakes. And so on this side, I've got the midget faded rattlesnake we've been talking about, and then a gopher snake. So they look fairly similar. Their patterns are kind of similar, though this one's a little bit darker. Um, but these guys actually use fear in a really interesting way. They take our fear of rattlesnakes and other um, predators' fear of rattlesnakes in their bite to their advantage. Um, they'll coil up just like a rattlesnake will. You can kind of see in this picture. And they'll shake their tail. They don't have a rattle on it, but they know that a lot of the things that might see this guy as a tasty snack probably won't want to tangle with one of these guys because of its venomous and painful bite. The gopher snake doesn't have that, but it uses that fear of the rattlesnake to its advantage to try to scare away predators or anything else that might try to mess with it. Um, so, you know, fear serves us in a lot of ways, helping us survive out in this world. Um, but we've got some very clever critters out here who use it to their advantage as well uh, to help them get through and kind of take that fear and turn it around on us, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so one of those other innate fears that we have are spiders. Uh, so I've got pictures of a couple common ones that you might encounter here in Moab. These are, I would say, top creepiest ones. You've got the black widow spider here. Has anyone heard of that spider before? Yeah, yeah we've got superheroes named after it. Yeah, I don't know. Anyone seen those? Uh, those movies? But yeah, and they're very distinct looking. These are the female ones. They've got this like black coloring. They're pretty big and they have that very distinct red hourglass on their bellies. Um, and then we also have over here called a golden huntsman spider. Um, not venomous, but they are big. Um, you know, their legs can probably span the palm of my hand you encounter like a big full grown one. Um, so that's a little scoop. Um, so and they're not venomous. Um, not to people, no. Yeah. Uh, so I know when I flipped to this slide, I heard a lot of murmurs and a lot of oohs. What is it about spiders that makes them creepy? They are. Yeah, I know for me it's it's the hairy ones yeah. that always gets me, the one with all the eyes. <laughs> so I feel like it's like snakes don't have legs, right? And spiders have a lot of legs. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's like something you want to snake number. You can't define a snake that way. It's based on the structure of the head. There are lizards that have no legs. Oh, Not no. necessarily here, okay. but there are. Yeah, full disclosure, I am a geologist, not a biologist. Um, so I just thought this would be a fun thing. I guess. <laughs> but yeah, there are legless lizards. Yep. I've heard of those. I think it's like you don't know where they're at. Like they're so small, they could be anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and they tend to be really good at blending in. This is a picture uh, of the Capitol Reef. And this spider, I mean, pretty sandy color, blends into that rock really well. And I think that's, yeah. That's a, that's a great point. Um, so spiders, even though they are creepy, we don't usually feel like they do anything for us. You definitely don't want them lurking around the corners of your house. If they are, um, they actually could be helping you out a little bit. Spiders tend to control insect populations, especially like the really annoying ones, like mosquitoes or gnats tend to fly around your house. Uh, some spiders, like the black widow um, build webs. Um, so black widows 
they are not, they don't build the prettiest webs. If you're out and about on the trail and you see kind of a long thread attached to like a tangle of web in a little alcove, um, that's often a black widow. They don't have the best structure to their nests from what I have seen. Um, and then these huntsman spiders they actually don't build webs to catch their prey. They kind of, they go out and they hunt it. Um, that's the name, I suppose. Um, so there's a couple different ways that they can control this insect population. Um, they're also prey for many other critters, just like those snakes. Um, birds, lizards tend to eat spiders. Those are usually ones we're a little bit happier to have around. I know I got some bird feeders out in my backyard, so mm -hmm. I like seeing those guys around. Um, and then another really cool thing about spiders is uh, a lot of the research that's being done with spiders. Uh, the scientific community has taken a real interest in spider venom and in spider silk. Um, so their venom is being used to create pesticides. Um, there's some research being done where they're looking at different spider venoms and trying to create it into these large scale pesticides that we can use. Because if you get bit by a black widow, uh, even though these are pretty famous for their venomous bite, unless you're allergic to them, um, it's, it's not going to kill you. It's going to hurt a lot. You might get like a big welt uh, on the site that it bit you, but Overall, you'll, you'll live to see another day. Um, <laughs> however, if you're a much smaller creature, um, like a cockroach or uh, a termite, things you wouldn't want hanging around your house, um, that venom then might be enough to do you in, um, but not, not harm other critters like dogs and cats that we might want to have in our house. Uh, so we've been doing some research on how we can take that venom and use it to our advantage. And then spider silk is also wild. Um, and it's often compared to steel in its strength, um, but it's much more flexible. And also the way that the spider produces this silk. So in its body, it starts as a liquid. And then once it's expelled kind of into the air, it turns into a solid. So it's almost like if you had a hose with water in it, it's water in the hose, but as soon as it hits the air, it turns into snowflakes. Um, so they've been studying that to try to figure out how to make fibers with it. Um, things like bulletproof vests, making better bulletproof vests um, that are lighter and just as strong as like the Kevlar ones we might have today and also medical applications. How to um, make fake tendons and ligaments out of the silk because it's super strong but also flexible. Um, so we might have these guys to thank later on for like a better quality of life for all of us. Um, and then, of course, we got predators. We do have some of those lurking out in the canyons. Uh, you know when you're out camping, you're in your tent and it's dark outside, especially in these international dark sky parks we've got here in Moab. Uh, it can be really hard to avoid thinking about what might be lurking outside your tent or what might be around the next corner of the canyon you're hiking through. Uh, so here, we do have mountain lions that live here. This is a photo uh, that was taken from a trail cam in Zion of a mountain lion uh, walking down the sandy wash. They're not very common, um, but they are out here, uh, as well as bears, black bears. Uh, so up in the Seoul Mountains, there's a pretty good population of them. Very occasional. <coughs> They'll wander down from the canyon and uh, they'll come exploring at Island in the Sky where you can usually find me. We don't have them very often, uh, but this year, for the first time in 10 years, there was a black bear sighting um, out by the Buck Canyon Overlook. I haven't seen him in a while. I think he was maybe just passing through. 
um, coming from the Colorado River side down to the Green River side. Um, but they are out here. They do wander into the canyons occasionally. Um, so these critters, like spiders, like snakes, they're part of that bigger food web. They perform really important ecological services to the desert ecosystem. These are kind of the big bad predators who are at the top of the food chain, um, right there along with us. So these guys, I'm always a little bit afraid of running into, whether I'm hiking around here or in the mountains. Um, I think for a lot of us, just knowing how big and how powerful they are mm -hmm. is super scary. I know that's what does it for me. Yeah. Or kind of here a question. Oh, you got a question? Um, what that? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. If you think of it, just mm -hmm. let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what should you do if you run into one of these guys? Um, so I've got some tips for you. Uh, if you're out hiking around here, anywhere else, if you run into a bear, it's best to identify yourself as human. Um, so wave your arms, talk to the bear, and we'll let it know you're there. Staying calm and remembering most bears probably don't want to attack you. Bears like um, the one in the picture I showed you, black bears. Um, they are omnivorous, but they mostly eat plants. Uh, insects or scavenge. They do hunt sometimes, um, but that takes a lot of energy and they're really focused on building up the stores of fat they have to get them through the leaner months in the winter time. Um, so they're not going to chase after you unless they feel really threatened or you come between a mom and her cubs. Uh, those are the things she is going to fight to protect the most. Um, the best thing you can do is just make a lot of noise, let them know you're around, and if you do encounter one, make yourself look as big as possible, scary, like it's something that you eh, might not want to mess with. Um, tips for mountain lions, fairly similar. Um, they will always let the rattlesnakes escape if you give them a chance. However, very important, you don't want to run from a mountain lion. Um, because that stimulates their chase instinct. Uh, so mountain lions, they are basically designed to hunt for deer. Uh, and deer, when they catch a whiff of prey, they'll often free, or predators, they'll often freeze and then take off because uh, they can generally sprint faster than the predators that are hunting them. So when you encounter a mountain lion, uh, if you stop and freeze and then run away, it triggers that same instinct as when they see a deer. Um, also, I recommend not to crouch down or bend over because uh, it might make you look more like a four-legged animal that that mountain lion might want for dinner. But in general, um, they're not after you. They don't want to mess with another predator kind of like us. Um, so. Bears and mountain lions out here, not something you have to be too afraid of, but they are pretty amazing, powerful creatures. Mm -hmm. So if you ever get the chance to see one of these, um, these are two critters that our wildlife folks are really interested in and their behavior out here. Um, so if you see them from a safe distance, definitely mm -hmm. let us know about it. Um, Cause we want to know more about what these guys are doing out in the canyons. Um, and then bugs are probably <laughs> some of my favorite creeper crawlies. I have bugs plural here, but we're mostly going to talk about one, um, which is the Jerusalem cricket, which is one of probably the few bugs I personally am not very fond of. Um, so I've got a picture of one, and I have a warning. So we got a gross <laughs> bug photo coming up, so prepare yourselves. Um, has anyone here seen a Jerusalem cricket before? Okay, so most of you don't know what's coming, and I'm sorry. Um, so this is a Jerusalem cricket. Um, they are 
mostly subterranean, so you won't find them out out and about um, unless you're either like digging in a garden or you're out at night. They do tend to come out at night. Uh, so the first time I saw one of these, I was in Escalante, and I screamed so loud. Uh, <laughs> my hiking buddy thought that I hurt myself, <laughs> and he comes running over, and he looks at me, he's like, what's wrong? And I'm just pointing, and he goes, oh my god, what is that? None of us had, neither of us had seen one of these before, um, and they are big. They can grow up to be up to three inches long, which is probably about as long as my thumb. They're really thick. Um, and I'm a weird kid. I used to make my mom go out in the garden and dig up worms with me and catch bugs. And so I didn't think there was a bug left that I didn't know anything about until I saw one of these. Um, I thought it was like a sick cricket or something. I thought maybe it was something that just molted. Uh, this one's wet, but they are generally like very shiny. They've got these huge like hind ends. And this one, you kind of see on the front here, it's got these kind of spiny legs. Um, that's mostly the males that have those. Um, so what is it about these that make them so scary? Uh, partially size, partially these teeth. <laughs> Um, and I think also they look very human in a way. Uh, they've got those big kind of front facing eyes, that round head kind of just like ours on this like big bug body. Very creepy. Um, but they're actually pretty harmless. They don't bite unless you're trying to pick them up and they feel threatened. It hurts because um, they got those big strong jaws that they use for just eating tough plants. So if you run into these guys, they're not going to hurt you. Um, they just look horrifying. <laughs> um, but they are very, very cool. So after I saw one, I went home and I tried to figure out what the heck this thing was. And I actually learned a lot about them and the way that they communicate. So since they spend most of their time underground, um, they don't have very good eyesight. They don't have very good hearing. And so they've developed this really unique way of communicating with each other, which is to drum their, um, their abdomens on the ground. Um, and that's how they communicate. I've actually found a video hmm. that shows that so you can hear it, because it's a really distinct sound. And if you're out and about in the desert at night, uh, you probably won't see them, but you might hear them, because um, they're quite loud. Bats are kind of going to be the last group of critters that I talked about. Um, bats are definitely one of those kind of like learned fears, mm -hmm. I think. You know, there are a lot of myths about bats. I have a friend who researches them. She also calls them sky puppies. Um, <laughs> so I think a few of us probably get to see them up close like this, but they are pretty cute when you look at their mm -hmm. little faces. Um, there are a lot of common myths about bats though. Um, being that they drink blood, uh, you know, got vampires out there who turn into bats. And that's how they come and they, they fly into your house and find you. Um, there are vampire bats that drink blood, mostly in South America, but it's not quite like the vampires that we think of. Um, they'll scratch the legs of larger animals like livestock and lap up the blood uh, that seeps from those cuts. Um, they're not coming after us, going for the jugular, or anything <laughs> quite that dramatic. Um, and then, you know, we'll skip to another three. Number three, the bats are blind. Um, kind of these, these weird uh, creatures that live in caves that, that come out and fly blindly around. Um, some bats see better than others, and with their echolocation, they can get a really amazing detailed picture of the world around them. Um, I think for some of us, the rabies is kind of the scariest thing about bats. Um, that all of them have rabies, so if you see one and they come towards you, uh, you're going to be in big trouble. But that's not necessarily true. Um, rabies. 
mostly comes from dogs. 99% uh, of rabies cases um, comes from, from dogs, not from bats. Um, and so rabies is pretty scary to be, but um, fortunately there are things we can do about it. You can get a vaccine if you run into an animal you think might be rabid. Uh, you can vaccinate your pets against it to help cut down on transmission. Um, and these bats, in general, do a lot of good for us. Um, one bat can eat a thousand mosquitoes an hour, um, which imagine a thousand less mosquitoes out in the world. That's pretty amazing. Um, guano, their waste is an excellent source of nitrogen, uh, which plants need to grow. And some bats, like this Mexican long tongue bat, um, are excellent pollinators. They don't eat bugs as much as they do nectar and pollen. Um, and does anyone here use agave as a sweetener? Yeah, a couple of us. Does anyone like tequila? Any of the grown-ups? Yeah. Um, so both of those things come from a plant that these bats pollinate. Um, and we wouldn't have those things if it weren't for that. Uh, so I've talked about all of these critters and in hopes that by learning a little bit about them, um, if you encounter them out and about, you'll be a little less afraid of them, a little less wary. Um, if you see a Jerusalem cricket, you won't just squash it. <laughs> if you see a snake out there, uh, you can still be a little afraid, but you can know that that rattlesnake will back away if you give it the chance. Um, and that it does some good for us by helping keep down rodent populations um, and you know, things like that. Um, now also, y'all came here knowing I was going to talk about these things. <laughs> I was going to talk about bugs, I was going to talk about bats, I was going to talk about snakes, um, these kind of big scary things. So that brings us to, you know, back to fear. And I know a lot of you made a lot of groans when I showed that Jerusalem cricket and you made uh, some fools when I showed those spiders. Um, so that raised just a question, do we enjoy fear? Uh, you all came here for fun. No one's making you do this. Um, and a lot of things point to yes. These are all pretty famous horror movies that have made lots and lots of money. Um, it, which came out in 2017, is one of the highest grossing horror films making paid as a 700 million. Yeah, see, it's way more than I get paid as a park ranger. <laughs> um, and some of these old ones, like Jaws, $470 million, that went a lot farther in 1975 than it does today. Um, so this fear, this thing that helps us survive, when we can do it in a controlled environment, when you know our our proof the, that that primitive instinctual part of our brain says we're in danger, but that conscious part of our brain says, oh no no, it's just a picture. Um, we are in control of this situation. Instead of being that mortal fear, it kind of manifests as excitement, as a rush. Um, and so Moab is a huge destination for extreme sports for folks who want to feel some of that fear, that adrenaline. Um, four-wheel drive, especially on routes like Hell's Revenge, uh, or some of the things that I do on the weekends, climbing and canyoneering, um, have to do with those big heights. We intentionally expose ourselves to those, even though we know we've got safety in place, um, to help us get through. Um, it's still, still exciting, um, still scary. And then there is a quite a large skydiving and base jumping community in the area, which I think is about as extreme as it gets. <laughs> um, even though I climb and canyoneer, I still got ropes to catch me. Um, if you're not familiar with base jumping, it is the practice of jumping off, uh, let's see, it's buildings, antenna, spans, which is like bridges, and the environment, so like large structures. Um, like this tower. I think I might be running a little short on time, so I might not show this video. 
Um, but this is definitely one of the things, one of the sports that gets me going in this video. Um, this man jumps off this tower. <laughs> he has a parachute. Um, but it's kind of the most extreme manifestation of that excitement that comes from fear. Um, and so whether you know you experience it by coming to this talk or doing one of those more extreme sports here in Moab, um, or if it's just fear that kind of gets you through a tough situation, um, it is something that kind of comes in handy. And I hope that you learned a little bit more about fear and about the things that cause us fear. Maybe you started taking a few steps toward um, learning some of those innate fears, spiders, snakes, um, kind of reverse that uh, fear of bats and predators. They are important to us out here. 